Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Angelic Conflict class. The night is the 2nd of November, 2023, and the time is now 7.16 p.m. I want to extend a warm welcome to all of you who are here uh, with us this evening. Today we are going to be finishing up this section on the... the uh, pseudo elements that satan brings into our society that are sometimes passed off as spirituality and uh, tonight uh, we are going to be looking at the final feature of this teaching which is the attitude of a christian what kind of a, an attitude should a christian have and there are some issues which uh, fall into play here, and some of these issues are very, uh, what should I call them, S obvious. And the obviousness of them is, uh, suppose that somebody just happens to irritate me, and I jump, I spark. Does that mean that I have not exhibited the uh, attitude of Christ or the attitude which I am commanded to uh, have in the second chapter of Philippians? And so hopefully these questions and others will be answered as we go through this uh, evening session. If uh, you have joined us this evening for the first time, we welcome you and we invite you to write down a comment or a question in the section which is provided for you by YouTube. If uh, you do not have a device that provides that, then uh, I would advise you and you should be looking at a screen right now that says the angelic conflict with big black letters. Our address, Evergrace Fellowship Church, P.O. Box 5301, Everett, Washington. And this is where we receive our mail, not where we meet on a face-to-face -face basis. The next point in our address is where we meet on a face-to-face -face basis. And if you would like to join us for Sunday worship services, the address is 4900 80th Street Northeast, Marysville, Washington, 98270. Now, if you would like to drop us an email, uh, you want to communicate with us, why well, you can uh, do so through uh, YouTube if uh, you have that facility. But if not, you will notice on the image on your screen at the lower left-hand corner and our... Uh, a website address which also provides a place for you to send us an email. It is efcministry.blogspot.com and we of course would welcome any of your comments. We are not soliciting you for money. We are not offering you any pamphlets so that you could send us a gift of any size. No, we are not doing any of that. If you want any of these materials, we would ask you to request them, and uh, we will send them to you electronically. We are not going to print anything out and send it to you. Uh, you can have it electronically. And of course, uh, this opens us up to somebody uh, looking at the electronic copy and doing something with it to change it. And uh, this is, of course, a risk that we must take. We will do all that is possible to keep our materials from being hijacked, being changed. Obviously, as artificial intelligence becomes more and more prominent uh, with the different varieties of artificial intelligence, it will become very easy for the wrong parties to take my image and my voice and to make me say things which are utterly untrue. 
as a result, I am telling you right now before that facility has become a reality in most people's lives that you need to align yourself with a church such as mine where you will get face-to-face -face Bible teaching. The Bible is the only, the Bible is the only word of God. What gets put on the internet may not be the word of God because it's so easy to change words and to make the Bible say that which it doesn't say. And the local church is the only organization that has been, shall I say, validated by God. The local church has been made the keeper of the Word of God. And so the local church is the only place where you will be guaranteed to get the Word of God, but it must be on a face-to-face -face basis. If you are saying, well, if the Lord doesn't return from the, another 10 years, I can kind of handle it online. Well, that's up to you. You are a believer priest, then you can take your chances if you like. The scripture says that if you have the hope that Jesus will come at any time, that you purify yourself, you prepare yourself, because on that day and at that moment, you will be like him, because you will see him just as he is. Well, that is a fairly lengthy welcome to all of you. And once again, welcome to the Angelic Conflict class. Before we begin, we will take a few moments for silent prayer. I want you to utilize this time of silent prayer to confess any and all sins that you might have so as to prepare yourself for the study of God's Word. Indeed, the study of God's Word is the most important thing that you will do today. And so it is incumbent upon you to focus and to be ready to receive. And it's incumbent upon me to prepare and to articulate to you what the Word of God says. Then I'm also going to ask you to pray for me that I might be a clear communicator, that I would be able to communicate to you coherently and convincingly what the Word of God is. So let's take a few moments for silent prayer, and I will close with audible prayer. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful that as a Father you have graciously provided for us a table a table with sumptuous spiritual food. And we ask that as we partake of this food that we might grow, that we might be strengthened, that we might be comforted. And Father, that in so doing, that we can not only glorify the Lord Jesus Christ as we speak to others, but glorify him in the angelic realm. We pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. And when we begin these classes, these sessions, we always begin with the reading of a certain section of Scripture. This is that section of Scripture. It is now on your screen. This is what it says. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Genesis 3, verses 14 and 15. I always remark, and I want to remind all of you, that this is the Lord Jesus Christ that is signified with the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D in the very first line. 
the Lord God, a compound name for God, and he is addressing the serpent. And the Bible tells us that the serpent is Satan himself. This is an announcement to Satan that he will have lost what we call the angelic conflict. Okay. <coughs> In our outline, which we started years ago, we are on letter F, victory on the angelic front. And we are on subpoint number five. That's five in the unmatched parentheses. The strategy of Satan. And we realize in letter A, uh, in unmatched parentheses, that religion is part of Satan's strategy. He uses religion in order to confuse people, in order to give people a false sense of security. And as a result, people will falsely and vainly walk through life in falsehood. And Hopefully, you're asking yourself this question, how can God permit that? Well, he doesn't give it validity. But he has given you as a person a believer priesthood. That means that you stand and fall before God. There is nobody else. There is no filter between you and God. And so God has given you the decision as to whether you're going to believe the truth or the falsehood. Now you might ask, how can I possibly know the difference? Well, let me tell you. There are a couple of overt pieces of evidentiary items. The first of them is the fact that a Bible exists. You have a Bible, and you probably have it on your lap right now. That is the first thing. This is a book which has existed and survived for centuries. It is a miracle book. That's number one. Secondly, you have a person. That person has the title of pastor or pastor teacher, like myself. We have been placed in an area where you have availability to me, and it's up to you as to whether you will maintain that availability or not and follow the instructions that I give. So you have, number one, a Bible. It's a physical piece of evidence. Secondly, you have a human being right here, yours truly. I'm not a phantom. I'm not a deep fake from the Internet. I am a real person. If you were to come to uh, join us in our face-to-face -face worship on Sundays, you would be able to see me, you'd be able to talk to me, and what's more, we would be able to go out to lunch together. So, letter A, religion is part of Satan's strategy. He makes a counterfeit plan, he makes a counterfeit religion, a counterfeit system, and many, many people fall into that trap trap of Satan. Letter B in unmatched parentheses. Satan's counterfeits the plan of the plan of God in religion include the following. It includes a counterfeit gospel, counterfeit ministers, counterfeit doctrines, counterfeit righteousness. In other words, there are some people who are proud of their righteousness. And God says your righteousness is as filthy rags. And then number five, and that is a counterfeit communion table, followed by number six, a counterfeit spirituality. And that is where our study is today, and that is where we are going to end today. We're going to finish this section on counterfeit spirituality. So what exactly is counterfeit spirituality? Well, let's see if we can put this down. And this is a greatly reduced, this is a boiling down of the studies that we've had over the last few months. Counterfeit spirituality. Well, it contrasts with true spirituality. True spirituality requires Bible teachings on, number one, 
the outline of 1 John chapter 1, verses 4, all the way to chapter 2 and verse 1. Now, obviously, I have made that particular distinction, and I have, shall, I, shall uh, we say, I have made that division. There are more verses, of course, but if we are going to be able to stay within boundaries, it's like coloring with a crayon. If you just color everywhere, pretty soon you don't know what you're looking at. But if you are careful to color within the lines, you have a much better picture at, of uh, what is in front of you. So, first of all, you need to have a real good understanding of the first chapter of First John the epistle of 1 John, and the first verse of chapter 2. Secondly, you need to also have some good teaching on what fellowship is. Fellowship is not having iced tea with somebody from the church. Fellowship is not having a Danish or a spaghetti feed or, or watching a movie. That's not fellowship. So you need to have you find what the teachings are in the scripture as to what real, true fellowship is. Thirdly, you need to have a good understanding as to what the edification complex of the soul is. Now, by complex, I don't mean, oh, I got a guilt complex. No, complex here means a building structure. So this is the structure of a building of your soul. You see, your soul is then likened to a building that you are constructing, that you are edifying, and uh, the, the more that you put into the building, the more strength the building gets, the more real the building gets, the more livable the building gets, and this is a metaphor for Christian growth. So, if we divide the whole gamut of Christian growth into five floors, if you are on floor one, you're a baby in Christ. If you are on floor two and three, then you might be a teenager in Christ, an adolescent. If you are on floor four, then you would be a, a, an adult in Christian growth. If you are on floor five, which is the top, that's the penthouse of this building, then you have reached spiritual maturity. You have gone far beyond just regular growth. You have gone beyond getting to the place where your body has developed adult qualities, you have gotten to the place where you share the happiness of God with him. So that if you get the diagnosis of cancer, you can thank God for giving you that diagnosis. You can thank God for having go through that experience. And you can thank God for the outcome of that experience. That is sharing the happiness of God. So, number one, 1 John chapter 1. Number two, understand what the Bible has to say about real fellowship. Number three, Christian growth. You need to have Christian growth defined for you. You have to have it illustrated for you so that you know precisely where you stand. Now, I know that there are lots of churches and they never even talk about the details of Christian growth. Avoid those places. Well, last of all, the doctrine of walking in the light. The doctrine of walking in the light. And that is where we are going to take off this evening. And we want to take note of this fact. That walking in the light means that as you go through life, that is phase two of the Christian life, Phase one, when you believe in Christ as personal Savior. That's the day, the night that you believed in Jesus. That is your come to Jesus moment, right? Phase two is what happens the moment after, the day after, the week after, the month after, the decade after. 
until the day you die. That's phase two. Phase three is when you are face to face with the Lord. So walking in the light refers to your lifespan and that your thinking is straight on certain things because it doesn't take a lot of spiritual uh, exercise for you to live from one day to the next. But it does when you are taking into consideration the spiritual incumbencies. So first and foremost, walking in the light means that you have the same opinion that God has concerning himself. Okay, I know that this sounds like a trick question, but somebody might ask you, do you think that God can deliver you from this situation? And you might answer, well, I've been in this for 20 years and he hasn't delivered me, so I, maybe he can't. That's the trick question. He can't, and he could, if he wanted to. He doesn't follow your whims or your desires. You say, well, what if I asked him? He is sovereign, he is all-wise, and he knows what's best for you. When you get to the realization that he knows what's best for you, and you appreciate that, then you have the same opinion about God. He knows best. He also knows best, and he has an opinion about your sins. You may say, well... I'm human. I just can't help it. This is, according to God, sin is sin. And you know what? It's punishable by eternal death. Huh? That means that little itty-bitty sin that you committed or that you are stomaching or that you are excusing, that is enough to send you to hell. You need to have the same opinion of your sins that God has. That's what it means to walk in the light. If you don't, not walking in the light, you're walking in darkness. And the Bible says that you're fooling yourself. That's why you need to go through 1 John chapter 1 and the first verse of chapter 2. You also need to have the same opinion that God has concerning his son. So there are these three areas. Opinion concerning himself. Opinion concerning your sin and opinion concerning his son. These are three very important areas where you have to line up your thinking. Otherwise, you're not walking in the light. Letter B. Having fellowship with God is another area that is that is conveyed by the phrase, walking in the light. In other words, when you're walking in the light, you have fellowship with him. What does the scripture say? If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, you see? Having fellowship with God, what this means, now I know I didn't quote the whole verse, but what this means is that in your mind, you are able to make the adjustments to the justice of God. So you tell yourself, I need to adjust to the justice of God. You did that the moment that you believed in Christ as your personal Savior. Because there's no way that you could pay the penalty for your sins. So how can you adjust to that rigid justice of God? Well, God provided a substitute for you. Jesus Christ, who died on the cross. When you say, I believe that he took my place on the cross, you've just made your first adjustment to the justice of God because you've said, he has paid the penalty for my sins. So having fellowship with God means that you make your next adjustment to the justice of God, and that is that every time that you sin, you confess your sin to God. 1 John 1, 9. That's adjustment number two. Adjustment number three is that as you go through life, you begin to add divine viewpoint to your viewpoints so that your mind is being 
So I say gradually transform to have divine viewpoint. And that is when you have fellowship with God. You make these adjustments to the justice of God. Thirdly, walking in the light means that you have the goal of Christian maturity. You say, now that I'm here, now that I'm saved and the Lord isn't taking me up to heaven, what is my goal? My goal is Christian maturity. That means maximum glorification of God. I know it just rolls easy off the tongue, so let me say it again. Not because it's easy to say or because it's uh, it rolls off the tongue easily, but because you need to understand this. Christian maturity means maximum glorification of God by you. So the reason that you want to be a spiritually mature person is so that you can glorify God the Father through Jesus Christ. Now this is maximum glorification of God is only accomplished in phase two. Okay. I know, sometimes we can kind of dicker with the word maximum. But, you see, to the degree that you are able to glorify God in this life, to that same degree, or shall we say, to that same level, you will be able to glorify God throughout eternity. So, if Christian maturity is 100%, and you get to 80%, then you die. That means that 20% didn't get used. You get to eternity, and you will be able to glorify God in eternity to 80%. There will be those next to you who glorify God to 85, 90, 100 percent. You see, there is no equality in heaven. God must be just, and he must reward everyone justly. So, that is why, while you are here on earth, the idea is glorify God to the max. Go to spiritual maturity. Maximum glorification of God. Okay. Now that I've said that, now we need to reorient a little bit with what the scripture has to say, so let me go to our scripture so that we can see this. This is a reading from, Genesis, from uh, Philippians chapter 127 all the way through the 15th verse of chapter 2. And let me read through this fairly quickly. We are going to go through this like a freight train. So please hang on to your seat. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, 
who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. For this reason also, God also highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world. Okay, let me indicate to you Philippians 1.27, and I want to tell you that we have the word conduct, but that it is the verb, and so it is conduct, you see, conduct yourself. The Greek word is the word polytu este, and the definition means that you should govern your life in such a way that you represent where you're from. We have noted the parsing as being a present tense, a customary present, and it denotes what habitually occurs or may reasonably be expected to occur among those who are advancing to maturity. Okay? Only conduct yourselves. Only conduct yourself. Present tense. Continuing action. Middle voice. This stresses the agent as producing the action of the verb for his own advantage and benefit. Conduct yourselves. In other words, the action comes back to yourself. How do you conduct yourself? Your, your brain tells your body it's time for you to get up in the morning and go to work. If you have control over yourself, you will get up and you will get yourself ready to go to work. And now... You have conducted yourself. If you don't conduct yourself, you say to yourself, I need to get up, but I don't want to, and you'll reach over and hit that snooze button. You're not conducting yourself. What you are doing is that you are indulging yourself. You are letting your body tell your soul what to do. And the scripture has it exactly the other way around. The tail shall not wag the dog. It is also an imperative mood, second person plural. Imperative mood means that this is a command. The original authority was the Apostle Paul as the human writer of this particular command, but he was also the Apostle Paul, and so he is not only commanding the people to conduct themselves, but he's putting it in Scripture, which means that it is a command to you and to me in the present day and age. Number two, there are four prophecies in verse one of Philippians chapter two. One deals with encouragement, if there is, and there is. Second is consolation, if there is, and there is. Fellowship, if there is, and there is. Affection and compassion, if there is, and there is. Four prophecies. They are all first class conditional sentences. Prophecy, uh, prophecy number four 
is the one that deals with affection and compassion. And I will go really quickly through this since we uh, went through this once before. And we will notice that this word for affection is the Greek word splagnon. And it is the word which is used to describe that feeling of your, your intestines moving when you see something that evokes your emotion. It may be, for instance, as it has happened to me on more than one occasion, that I come across an accident, an automobile accident, and the poor person, the victim of the accident, has been ejected from the car, and the intestines, the visceral sac has been broken, and the intestines are now up out on the pavement. You know what? I looked at that, and I had an awful feeling in my stomach, and I had that awful feeling in my stomach for a while. Why is that? It's an emotional response. At the same time, at the same time, I have seen my football team win a game, and something surges from within me and almost yells hallelujah because it's a wonderful thing to see. That is something that happens on the inside and works its way to the outside. Splagnot. This is that term which denotes something that is happening on the inside because you are reacting emotionally to something else. The next word that we see is the Greek word oitirmos, and this is the heart of compassion. Now, the heart of compassion is the reaction that your mind is telling your body to do. Now, there are two words that are used to describe this situation. And uh, the first one is found in 2 Corinthians 1, 3. And this is the Greek word hupomone. I suggest to you look up the series on hupomone and macrotumia. Hupomone is when you exercise great patience in the face of unreasonable circumstances. The next word is the word makrotumia, and this word is found in Colossians 3.12. And this is when you endure with great patience unreasonable people, persons. I don't know, maybe you've never had to do that. I have a sneaking suspicion that you have. You need this doctrine to be able to pass that test. Okay, since these four prophecies are true, in other words, since there is any encouragement in Christ, and it's true, make my joy complete. Each one of these four prophecies has the same apotheosis, and that is make my joy complete. Make my joy complete. This means that individually and collectively, that is, as a congregation, they should have the same mind, maintain the same love, the same spirit, intent on the same purpose, and so on and so forth. You can read this passage, it is verses 2, two through 5, ending in verse 5, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. So when we get to verse 5, we find that all of these things that are mentioned here are attitudinal. They are verbs of the mind. Have this attitude in yourself. So, Word of warning, there is no way that you should model your life after the, the life of a fellow congregant, somebody in your church. You will never find a perfect person to be a model for you, so forget about it. Instead, you need to use the person of Christ as your pattern. He is the perfect example of humility. Verse 4. 5, Philippians 2 says, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also Christ for this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him 
the name which is above every name. Okay. Had this attitude. The Greek is this uh, word, tuto dar phronesto. The word tuto is a near demonstrative pronoun. The word dar is a post positive, which means that it's in the second place in the alignment of the sentence. The verb proanisto is a present passive imperative third person plural. Did I say third person plural? It should, it should be uh, a different person. Anyway, present tense means that this is continuous action. The passive voice means that the subject receives the action, the benefit of the verb, the imperative mood, means that this is a command not just to wish the thinking that Christ uh, had uh, should be the thought or the attitude which is sustained by the believer as his policy of life. So getting back to the parsing uh, should be present, passive, imperative. This word means the mental attitude of Christ. This is the mental attitude of humility. This means that the believer should not just emulate what Christ did, but to embrace and espouse the very same attitude that Christ had. Pastor. We interrupt this particular session. Pastor. The word in question is a verb, yet you have translated it as a noun. Why the shift? Why the shift? Well, here's the reason why the shift. The literal words of this verse, that is verse 5, are, have this attitude in yourselves, that's second person plural, found that way in the, in the New American Standard Bible, that's the NASB. The um, Greek, uh, I just put up on the screen, uh, and to, let me give you the transliteration. Tuto means this, phronesto means think, to yourselves, and whom in, in you all, second person plural. So here we have these three words, this, think, in yourselves. Okay, the word is think, it's a verb. Now take a look at your English translation, and I want you to notice that there is no have in English. Have is the only way that we can conceive of the finished act of thinking. We call it a thought. We have to use a helping word, and that's the word have. Because the verb is a durative, present tense, the thought is elongated into an attitude. So a thought is this wide, an attitude is this wide. It's the policy of thoughts. It's the way in which you govern your life. Why the shift? It is because it is a thought that has been elongated. It is a policy of thoughts. It is an internal guidance system. And this internal guidance system is commanded to be accepted and embraced by Christians so the English words in yourselves are used to express the passive voice of the Greek, which imply that the producer of the action, which is you, a Christian, do so for your personal benefit. Secondly, this is described as being the same policy of the thoughts held by Christ Jesus. We find this in our verse 5. That policy of thoughts is given a description which is among the finest of all the prose found in any English language. So read uh, chapter 2 and you will find it to be so. In modern English, we call it the policy of thoughts as an attitude. When we in modern America re refer to an attitude, we talk about the R factor. Now, these next couple of slides, I'm going to go through them fairly quickly. Uh, they deal with what our sociologists, our psychologists, refer to an attitude. 
and they often refer to the R factor as how it is that you respond to any given situation. Your attitude has a direct impact on how you communicate and collaborate with other people, how you uh, contribute to your society, to your work environment. Ultimately, your attitude shapes your success and your happiness. <clears throat> Letter E. The reality is that you determine your attitude. Let me repeat. The reality is that you determine your attitude. Your attitude is one of the few things in life over which you have total control. Harvard psychologist William James, the greatest discovery of my generation is that a human being can alter his life by altering his attitudes of mind. Please. This is not a preacher saying this. This is a psychologist who was the head of the psychology department at Harvard University. Attitude is the way you look at life. It is the way that you choose to see and respond to events, situations, people, and how to respond to yourself. Your attitude is not something that happens to you. You choose your attitude. Your attitude is created by your thoughts, and you choose your thoughts. You are the architect of your frame of mind. You decide how you will perceive and process the events of life and work. Successful people think differently than average people. Successful people produce better outcomes because their R factor is guided by a positive and proactive mindset. Their mind is not cluttered or distracted by pessimism. They are able to focus all of their mental energy on exploring for solutions, taking effective action, and learning how to get better as a person. A negative attitude is the result of negative thinking. It is a lack of mental discipline. It focuses on the problem and stops looking for solutions or opportunities. Okay? So, if you just want to vent, if you just want to express yourself, if you just want to tell people how you feel, negative thinking. A negative attitude can only survive on a steady diet of negative thoughts. A negative attitude is habit-forming, and it has an important impact on you and the people who are around you. In order to have a positive and proactive attitude, you must be disciplined and deliberate about the way you see and think about events, situations, people, and yourself. The way you think drives the way you feel. Therefore, consciously managing the way you perceive circumstances and events. So why the shift? Well, let me give you seven disciplines or seven practices. They are rules, but they are hard to enforce on a consistent basis. So they're called disciplines. In other words, this is what you want to adhere to, but uh, you won't have 100% success in adhering to them. Number one. Be self-aware of your attitude. Don't just let it happen to you. Pay attention to it. In other words, an attitude is something you control. It's not something that, control, that controls you. Refocus, reframe, and respond. Those of you who have taken defensive driving courses have heard this over and over again. You're in the freeway. Somebody cuts you off. Somebody does something that ticks you off. Refocus. Get your mind back on your driving. Reframe. Put yourself back where I'm at, what I'm going to do. And then respond. Slow down, change lanes, get out of the way, whatever. Do this when your attitude becomes impulsive or negative. C. Beware of the things that trend or that tend to trigger a disruptive attitude in you. I don't know what it is for you. Maybe it is somebody who is chewing gum and clacking 
their gum as they're talking to you. Or maybe it's somebody who is talking to you and every other word is punctuated with, you know, you know, you know. Anticipate the situation, plan ahead. Maybe, and I had this happen to me on one particular occasion, a very, very attractive young uh, lady lawyer wanted to say something to me in private so that it wouldn't be heard by the rest of the courtroom. And she came up to my face and she whispered, and she had the worst coffee breath you can imagine. You know what? I don't know what my face did, but I can imagine that it wrinkled up and wanted to turn away. If you know that that person has halitosis, then anticipate, plan ahead as to what you might do. Lastly, ruthlessly eliminate the BCB factors from your life. What are they? First of all, blaming others. That's the B. C, complaining. And then thirdly, being defensive. Um, always jumping on somehow, rather than solving the problem, on uh, saying, it's not me, it's not me. Okay. Now, these things that we have just looked at, in our modern American minds, these are the ways in which our psychologists tell us that we can cope with our unexpected circumstances. So the reason that I have made a shift from a verb to a noun is that our modern American minds can best visualize the concept of verse 5, that is, keep on thinking this in yourselves, for your benefit, which was also in Christ Jesus. In other words, the continuous action of thinking something in yourself and for your benefit is best conveyed by have this attitude. In other words, it is word for word perfect to translate it, but it's so awkward and it can be so much better streamlined with the words, have this attitude. B, attitude is a manner of thinking or a manner of feeling or behaving that reflects a state of mind or a disposition. And you are in control of that. The attitude in question is further defined in verse 5 as that attitude which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, I would at this point launch into why it doesn't say Jesus Christ. It says Christ Jesus, but I won't. Look at that particular arrangement of words and maybe you can come up with a good reason why. Number nine. Number nine. Because an attitude is easy to camouflage. Proverbs 23, 6 through 9. Now, let me show you how there are people who will deceive, we can even say they will gaslight you, by camouflaging their attitude with something which is good. Proverbs 23, verses 6 through 9. Let me point that out here. Proverbs 23, verse 6 says, Eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye. And what does, it, what does that mean? It means don't uh, eat what this person with an evil eye, evil intentions, consumes. Neither desire thou his dainty meats. Now there are some very precious thoughts in this person's mind, and he considers that to be the most precious of thoughts. Don't participate in that thinking. Verse 7, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. 
verse 7 just tells you that he says one thing, but he thinks another. In other words, he will camouflage his attitude, but as he thinks in his heart, that's the way that he is. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. That's verse 7. Verse 8. The morsel which thou hast eaten, shalt thou vomit up and loose thy sweet words. So, when you participate in this person's scheme, this person's machinations, you will say, oh, I didn't mean that at all, and you will vomit it up, and your sweet words will turn into sour words. You might cuss that person out. You might cuss somebody else out. You will have turned. Why? Because that person's attitude was camouflaged, and you fell for his ambush. Verse 9. Speak not in the ears of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of thy words. So here it is. Don't try to correct this person, because this person has his mind already made up, and you will be despised for giving those words to him. So let's go back to our thought. Why this shift? Because an attitude is easy to camouflage, Proverbs 23, verses 6 through 9, and therefore difficult for us to identify and to emulate. We need a pattern, a paradigm, a model, and that pattern is Christ Jesus. Okay, this is why you can't depend on a fellow believer. You can't depend on somebody else. You must depend on Christ to be your pattern. Here is his own invitation. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall receive or find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Okay. First and foremost, in verse 28, the Lord gives his own invitation. He invites you to take whatever is burdening your soul and to put it in his hands, and he will give you rest. No psychologist can do this. No life coach can do this. No spouse can do this. No foreman on the job can do this. Not even a pastor can do this. And don't get the silly idea that you can go to a Zen camp and uh, sit cross-legged and you will do. No. Only the Lord can give you rest. Verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. This is a phrase, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. This is a phrase that we used in the time of Jesus for a rabbi to recruit a disciple. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. In other words, this is an invitation for you to get his word and to study his word, to learn from him. However, there's a yoke that's involved, and that is because only the word of God will work. You can't use something else. There are those individuals who want to marry, that want to integrate earthly wisdom Eastern religion wisdom with the Bible. It does not work. Learn of me, verse 29 says. Reason why? I am meek and lowly in heart. 
please notice what the Lord Jesus says about himself. And ye shall find rest unto your souls. There was something about his meekness. There was something about his demeanor. And what is that? Well, we just saw it in Philippians chapter 2. That communicates rest to your souls. No one else can do this for you. Matthew 11.30, what does it say? For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Here you have our own Lord's invitation for you to use him as a pattern for learning. But the Bible doesn't just leave it to his own invitation. There is also the recommendation by the apostles. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 18. Well, we just read that a few moments ago. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Just verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Why does it say to turn your eyes upon Jesus? Because he has set down the pattern. He is the author and finisher of our faith. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, the imitators of God, in this case God is Christ, as beloved children, and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Here you have the recommendation of the Apostle Paul given to us with an enjoyment. And he tells us that our Lord Jesus Christ loved us. He was motivated by love. He gave himself up for us. And it was an offering uh, to God. And by offering it means that it is something that God accepted. It wasn't just an empty gesture. It was a fragrant aroma. In other words, not only did God accept that offering of Christ, but as he inhaled the aroma, it was delicious it was fragrant for him you can have the same effect on god you can produce that fragrant aroma when you follow the pattern of our lord jesus christ first peter chapter 2 verses 21 through 23 different apostle altogether remember this is that apostle who was a blustery who was outspoken, uh, who spoke out of turn, who said unbelievably stupid things, and then the Spirit of God came upon him with the advent of the Spirit, the day of Pentecost, and he now tells us in some of the wisest words of the New Testament how it is that our Lord Jesus Christ is our pattern. Now, he is doing so in a letter that he wrote to some believers that were suffering unbelievable suffering. Their endurance of the suffering is similar to what is going on today in the Hamas-Israeli war. So, this is what he says, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 23. For you have been called for this purpose... Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Let me read that over again. Leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. What steps are those? He committed no sin. This is called undeserved suffering. 
nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Look at this last line of verse 23. Instead of reviling, instead of threatening, instead of saying, I'm going to get even with you, he kept entrusting himself to God the Father. This is what you're called upon to do. This is what you're called upon to do. He is a pattern. Satan offers you all spirituality. This is genuine spirituality. Well, a summary, and then with this, we uh, want to uh, close. Summary. How should a Christian look? Well, first of all, you can't tell a Christian by the color of the skin. So the skin of his or her, uh, the color of his or her skin is not a factor. His or her genetic background is not a factor. There are people who say, well, you know, if you were only born Asian, you would be Zen. It would be part of your nature. Let me tell you, you have been given another nature. It's a new nature. And it's a new nature that is governed by God. And it will only respond to the Word of God. So that when the Word of God dwells richly in you, you will have the peace of God which passes all understanding. Number three. His or her position in Christ is the determining factor as to how a person looks. Position in Christ is an inner possession that is a reality in heaven. So when you are looking at a person who is in Christ? You can't tell. You can't tell by the color of his skin. You can't tell by the family um, background that he has. The only way that you can tell is that the Bible says that those who are believers in Christ are in Christ. It is an inner possession that that person has, and that inner possession, the reality of that is found in heaven. Let her be, but it is invisible to humans. You can't see it, can't taste it, can't smell it. Now let me tell you why this is important, because there are some of you who are sitting and listening to me, and you have not believed in Christ as your personal Savior. You want me to tell you what's the worst thing that can happen to you? You could die. That is, you would come to the end of your life. And let's say that you are in your middle 20s or 30s and that you are having the best time of your life. You didn't begin to have the best time of your life until you were 21, of course. And so maybe for the last uh, 10 years or maybe even 20 years, you have had a ball. That is the best time that you will ever have throughout eternity. Because from the day that you die, from that point on, things get worse and worse and worse and worse. And you may have told your mom that you are a Christian, but you weren't. Your mom would like to believe you, but she can't see your inner possession. Only God can. Your life will soon be over, whether you live to be 30, 60, 90, 130. And that 130 year span will seem like a drop in the bucket throughout all eternity. Don't you want to live in bliss? Don't you want to have happiness for all of eternity? Why would you want to trade 
some transitory happiness for that which is permanent. You see, I can't tell whether you have Christ in you or not, but you can. And you can do so by trusting Christ as your personal Savior. You can do it right now in the privacy of your mind. You can tell God that you believe in Christ as your personal Savior. Now, that invisibility of identity is refracted in the believer's attitude. When you become a believer in Christ and you begin to take on this attitude and it begins to be substantiated and, shall we say, filled up with the Word of God, a refraction takes place. And now that becomes more and more real. And even though on earth it will have very little basis for identification, in heaven it will go on forever honoring and glorifying God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bow for a closing word of prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you sent your Son to die for us despite the fact that we are unworthy, despite the fact that we are unlovely. We thank you that you have opened up heavens for us simply by our believing in Christ as personal Savior. We thank you for this salvation which is full and which is free. Now, Father, we also pray for those who are in the audience who are believers. We ask that you would bless each one and their families. We pray, Father, for your richest blessings upon them, and especially now when it seems that our country is tottering on the edge of destruction. We pray for these things in Christ's name. Amen. We are dismissed, and I thank you very much for joining us this evening, and I look forward to seeing you on Sunday, which will be a couple days from today, at Marysville. Thank you, and good night.